Hi, this is Joe Rosé, CEO and founder of Sprigio, and I have with us a very special guest I'd like to welcome back to the Expert Interview Forum. This is David Perodin, who is the Director of Student Services for the DeForest Area School District in DeForest, Wisconsin, where he oversees special education, counseling, nursing, social work services, and crisis preparedness and response. As a recognized leader in the area of crisis preparedness and response, David will be presenting before a live audience this coming May 8th as part of an hour-long feature on school security, school crisis preparedness, and what is known about active shooter situations. The event will be hosted by Wisconsin Public Television on this timely topic. Uh, a quick aside, David was also our first recipient of the National Spring Award for Excellence in Social Change which I had the privilege of presenting to him just this past October at the Great Lakes Behavioral Summit, an event that he co-founded two years ago. David, you're well on your way to a PhD in educational leadership there at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as being a father of two. You lead a full life indeed. Welcome back to the interview forum. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Joe. And to my uh, right, I have the uh, Sprigio Award right here. Um, this should be actually in the shape of a key because it's uh, opened up many doors uh, for career advancement uh, for me. Uh, but I think what, what it has done is also um, been a, a very nice springboard to get the message out about uh, school safety, uh, the role of uh, school connectedness and responding to bullying, um, and, and how that links in with a, a safe and productive school environment. Uh, always good to uh, be back and communicating with Sprigio and the audience um, that uh, that follows uh, the the wonderful uh, expert witness, or actually not expert witness, but expert panel that uh, Sprigio puts together. Uh, boy, when I watch those videos, uh, I learn I learn a lot. Um, so thank you for having me back today. Absolutely, you're welcome. That's the topic of our discussion today with you: school security and crisis preparedness. I have three questions that I'd like to ask you. And if you are a, a school official, parent, or community member uh, watching this video right now, this is information that is certainly directed toward you. Are you ready, David? Yes, yes. Okay, first question. What are some of the questions that school officials are being asked by teachers, parents, community members, in the media regarding school security and crisis preparedness? And how are you personally responding to those questions? Uh, you know, Joe, I think initially we can't lose sight of uh, the fact that schools are statistically one of the safest places a child can be, and, and to put that at, at the forefront. Um, but right now, people are understandably shaken and seeking assurances uh, from their school district uh, following, uh, you know, the recent events which have happened with active, um, with active shooters. Uh, you know, schools are also core to our lives. Uh, we've had schools for um, hundreds of years in the in the country. Uh, we've gone through schools. So it's something that we know. It's an environment uh, that we're familiar with, uh, um, a context. And, and so when something happens to disrupt that, I think it, it really hits hard. Um, following, following the incident um, at Sandy Hook, um, I have a first grade daughter. To send her back to school on that Monday was extremely difficult for me. Now, we're a thousand miles away. Um, I'm very uh, confident in my school system. They, they do a, a wonderful job with uh, school security, uh, with uh, crisis preparedness. But still, um, I felt really helpless as a parent and, and felt very nervous, um, not really for what um, the school wasn't doing, because, again, I, I felt they were very prepared, but for just uh, what might be happening with uh, you know one individual in society who might be seeing something on the news and, and want to you know, emulate that. So... Um, you know, I also speak, uh, again, from the parent standpoint and from a parent, um, you know, of a, of a first grader as one of my daughters. Uh, you know, we have discussions uh, where uh, people think of uh, simply banning weapons or in installing high-end security uh, is going to be the solution. Um, but really, you know, there is no single solution to preventing school violence. Um, and that's, that's really hard for people to grapple with. Uh, we want to keep children safe, yet we want to have a democratic safe, um, free society where we can, you know, cross, for example, a border from state to state with having, without having to put a passport and a checkpoint and things. It, it, it's a real balance. Um, I, I had something arrive in the mail the other day, um, 
and this is a, a magazine from a, a military surplus uh, store. And a couple of years back, um, I had ordered some things from here. Um, now, I don't know, like a canteen or some things like that. Uh, and I remember, um, you know, what the magazine was like. And as I go through it now, Joe, um, probably one third of the magazine is devoted to uh, survivalist and, and prepper type um, items. So as, as I was looking through this, um, what struck me too is that you know, we also have a society, I, I think, that's kind of um, in a mode of preparing for something bad to happen. And, and we really haven't experienced that um, before. But, and we have TV shows where we you know, have preppers and survivalists and, and people really believing that there's going to be this mass chaos and, and that they, they have to prepare themselves for that. So I think those threads are out there and, and that also ripples across schools and communities and, and um, does a lot to raise the anxiety level. Um, but as you had indicated in your original um, question to me, you know, what have we been hearing from parents? We have had a lot of input from parents and community members, and it kind of comes down into three to three categories. And one is uh, arm your schools with uh, police and guards. And we had a uh, community member and very well intentioned, um, but said, uh, if you can give me a list of everything you need for school security, that I will I will personally champion that referendum, and we will get everything we need to to make it a safe environment. Um, people from um, the community who said you know that they would come in and, and um, protect schools because you know they they were members of you know gun affiliations and, and so forth. And so really, people wanting to secure the environment and being very positive with that. But, uh, you know, as we look at discussions, people, people get really narrow on that, that two parents of saying, if we, can, if we can just get this building to a, a status where people have, um, you know, multiple checkpoints that they have to go through and um, that, that we have bulletproof windows, maybe steel doors, metal detectors, uh, the building will be safe. Um, and, of course, we consider all of those things. I mean, we don't dismiss anything. Um, but, you know, it's just not a building that, that we talk about. Uh, we have students, um, what if a student, uh, a bus is coming in with 50 students and somebody gets on the bus who's an active shooter or a student? Um, what if somebody, you know, is waiting out for the playground? I mean, these are all what if scenarios. And we could talk about that just in general if we go to the mall or, you know, what if we go to a restaurant or things like that. Um, but but the people want to be helpful um, in and we, we have these, um, you know, these recommendations that come out that, that really, I think, um, you know, need to be weighed very carefully about what do we do to preserve a safe school environment um, versus also making some, a structure that that's, um, actually kind of promotes uh, fearful sensing kids. Um, bulletproof windows, there was, a, there was a school shooting in Wisconsin a few years ago and a report out after that where the law enforcement said um, bulletproof windows would have actually impeded their ability to respond to the situation. Um, if they need to uh, use a sniper, a sharpshooter, to end the situation from outside, they can't do that if there's bulletproof glass, if they can, can see the shooter inside. So um, it's, it's all within people wanting to have a safe environment, but we have to weigh out you know, what, what that means uh, from a practical standpoint. Uh, the bottom line, though, is to right away look, if you can lock your entrances, which schools do, but make sure your entrances are locked, uh, make sure people have a check-in process for your buildings that they can't get in the building and, and down the hallway before somebody sees them. Uh, those are, those are going to be two of your most um, significant steps in promoting school safety. My guess, Phil, or it is we'll have our fill of changes in um, school design in the future. Um, I went to Walmart the other day and, and it kind of stood out to me that they have the barriers in the front so you can't drive a vehicle into the doors. Uh, my guess is we'll probably see that in new school buildings too that you'll have um, you can only get so close to some of those entrances uh, with a vehicle too. I mean that I, I would expect to see that. Um, the other the other part, Joe, is parents will say if we can screen, Every student, we'll be able to pick out the students who are prone to become active shooters. And unfortunately, and I'll, I'll talk about the, um, the Secret Service um, report that came out in 2002 that looked at school shooting profiles, but uh, 
the, the data doesn't support that at all. And actually, um, in large part, a screening isn't going to detect um, students that would be prone necessarily to, to school violence or prone to be um, conducting attacks. So while screenings definitely have a, a benefit, and, and I frankly think um, schools uh, could use much more from uh, legislative support and resources and mental health screening and mental health services, uh, simply going through and screening isn't, uh, isn't the answer. Um, working with the community, working with your United Way, working with your county, uh, identifying services that are available, uh, uh, definitely a way to go um, for parents and families if there are concerns regarding a student depression or mental health. Um, but some, you know, some things that we've done, um, we put together a, a really thorough um, scope and sequence for our counselors, making sure that we're addressing things such as school connectedness um, and mental health at different levels, kindergarten, first grade, second, all the way up. Um, I put together uh, talking points for our principals. So they have talking points back with parents in the community saying, here's what we've done already for school safety. Here are things that we're uh, looking at uh, to put that data available. Uh, Joe, parents, parents really just want to know that you're on top of this, that you have a plan and, and that you have been addressing things and you're looking at it. And once you communicate that, that's, that does a lot to calm the waters. We annually compile all of our discipline district, um, or our discipline in our district, and um, all of our behavior reports. We put that together and present that at a school board so it isn't a public forum. And we analyze that and report on any trends and, and things that we're doing too. So again, we're getting that data piece and, and reflecting that um, back into the community. Uh, schools also can contact their insurance carrier for loss prevention. Every school has an insurance carrier. Um, they will typically come out and if you invite them, do walkthroughs of your school, look at your entrance uh, protocols, and give recommendations to make, um, make those safer if need be. I, th I, I think a trap door to that, Joe, is um, I know uh, some districts and smaller districts where the, uh, the staff, buildings and grounds or principals might take that on themselves and walk through and say, here's the key to making this uh, entrance safer. Maybe we put a desk here, we change up this. Um, while that's well-intentioned, um, leave it to the professionals that have the architectural background who study um, entrances and, and safe ways to enter and exit buildings. Um, Bring, definitely that is worth uh, the investment of um, contacting your insurance carrier, maybe even an independent uh, firm to do that. And, and uh, you know, hold listening sessions, not only um, for parents, but for your staff. And let them and, and principals say, here's what I'm feeling about uh, school safety and where we're at and, and things I want to talk about. Um, people ask, where do you involve kids in this? Um, do you let kids know more of what's going on or, or do you try to protect them from it? And I think it's a bad balance emergency planning, the STEP program. And fifth graders go through, if, if schools participate, a training on school preparedness and how to respond to crisis um, situations. So that, that definitely is a resource in Wisconsin available. Um, but making students aware of the drills and the purpose of the drills and having a discussion, um, if, they, if they understand it, if they've been drilled, they will respond the way that they've been trained. So, you know, that's another key. And then... Um, you've, you've touched on, uh, David, if I could interject here for a second. I think you've touched on really some of the major issues that uh, that school officials in particular are struggling with and right. trying to partner with parents and community members in an effective way that makes sense, it's practical to really get towards the overarching goal, which is school safety and community. Uh, love the discussion, which actually took me into or took us into the one of the other questions today, which was how do you as a school official effectively communicate? the safety school status of the environment and, and to what extent do you involve uh, the students in that and, and you again shared some very practical ideas including speaking with uh, you know districts insurance carrier and, and a lot of ideas around those points as well. 
I think there's something there, though, that I'd like to dig into that sure. um, that we haven't really covered in this discussion, which is there seems to be some myth around what actually causes active shooter situations sure. uh, and how we respond to those. And I know there's been significant work that's been done in that area. So I think the question I'd like to ask is what do we really know about active shooter situations and active shooters? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Joe. Uh, if any of us were to sit down and say, uh, paint us a profile of an active shooter, and, and let's make it specific with an active shooter in the school setting, um, the knee-jerk reaction on that is, um, okay, this is going to be a male, it's going to be a teenager probably, uh, they're going to be very disenfranchised with school, um, you're going to be able to identify this kid because they're, you know, they're probably wearing grungy clothing. They don't like going to class. Um, that um, they, their grades are horrible. Their attendance is horrible, and and uh, they're they're getting in fights. They bully other kids. And so um, people will, will quickly come to to that uh, kind of profile. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what. The research has shown the actual authentic uh, profile, which um, which is actually much different than what I've what I've described to you. So, um, first of all, active shooter situations last about twelve to fifteen minutes. Um, that's that's it. I mean, it's a short time, but obviously, uh, every, every minute that passes would feel like an eternity in a school setting. So, we're looking at twelve to fifteen minutes. So, if we go back to uh, locking down the the um, school as far as uh, people having to go through a um, checkpoint, a locked um, entrance, and then also when schools are in lockdown, the internal classrooms are locked, that the pattern seems to be, um, and, and as I say this, I'm citing uh, research from the Secret Service, um, Senate, or the Department of Ed, and then also Homeland Security. Uh, Secret Service in 2002 released a final report on um, active shooters in the school setting. They analyzed 37 um, school shootings occurring from 1974 through 2000, including Columbine. And um, the, the, they worked with many partner universities on that. It was a, a huge uh, undertaking. And their, their goal is to try to figure out, you know, what, was there anything that was known in these situations that could have predicted these, uh, that this was going to happen? Um, but again, we come back to the active shooter situation. It's 12 to 15 minutes on average. Um, it's very, it's becoming more frequent, but not necessarily more frequent in a school setting, just more frequent in general. Again, we've seen theaters, political rallies, uh, malls, things like that. Um, it's very unpredictable. There's not a pattern that the, the active shooter will follow. And um, it's not really revenge um, specific to a person. Uh, they don't come in and target one or two people. It's really a, an intent to inflict a volume of harm. So those are some things that we know of, of the situation. So if we go back again in the earlier discussion, um, if you can keep your buildings locked down and, and it's difficult to, to get into parts of the building, that's going to consume time from the active shooter. Uh, studies have shown once a shooter gets in a building, uh, they're typically they're not kicking down locked doors and going into that. If there's um, resistance, they will move on to the next area and the next area. So again the longer you can keep that shooter out of the rooms and kind of trying to just to navigate the area, that gives your law enforcement time to respond. So, um, so Joe, again, we, we look at a profile, and I'm going to share some really interesting information that, that I pulled out of the research. So, first of all, um, all of the attackers were male, all 37, not one female um, active shooter. So... We do know that they range in age from 11 to 21. Uh, two thirds came from two parent families. Now, um, most, and this is really surprising, but uh, 40, 41% of the, the students, uh, the active shooters, had A's or B's in school, Joe, A's or B's. And uh, nearly half were involved in either athletics or an organized activity. So if we look at the number of students, um, active shooters that were failing, it's 5%. That's what the research shows us. So most are not your failing dropout kids. So uh, again, people will say, if we can just get these kids uh, to have better grades in school and 
um, you know, the, the, or the dropouts. Again, you know, it's not the case. Um, so we can't, we can't let ourselves go down that pattern because that doesn't get at a root cause. It's not a root cause. 64% um, of the attackers never had trouble in school or very, very thin discipline records. So nothing out of the ordinary and probably actually um, almost extraordinary discipline records in a, in a positive way. And Joe, this is fascinating. They looked at um, active shooters, the students, again, I'm talking about um, students, and right before the, the incident, they looked back on their performance in school, their academics and discipline, and here's what they found. The, their discipline did not increase. So it wasn't like, like we also got to a point of discipline referrals and being kicked out and everything, and now they finally snapped and, and they came back and did this. Uh, discipline didn't increase in suspensions, things like that. Um, and as far as academic performance, it did not decrease. For some students, their grades actually got better right before they decided to attack the school. So, boy, very counterintuitive. And again, makes us um, makes us have to, I, I think, think twice about trying to profile uh, anybody out for an active shooter situation. But um, there is some information, Joe, that really is helpful that we we need to look at. And one is uh, 40, 46 percent, or roughly half, of the attackers were found to not have close friends or to be described as loners, even including A B students who were very athletic, who people would describe as very connected, you know, with, with understanding school. They knew what to do to get good grades and, and be good in sports. But people would say, yeah, but, you know, looking back, they didn't really have any friends. Um, it was just they were isolated. It was just them. And I've talked about this before, but the Centers for Disease Control did a research study, again, a multi-agency research study, and talked about um, what makes kids strong and, and resistant to uh, becoming involved in drugs and negative school behaviors. But one of those was um, what makes it less likely that a student will be engaged in school violence? And statistically, what will make it less likely? And they said um, if students feel like they belong at the school and feel connected to peers and adults and have, you know, I guess friends and relationship, but feel connected, that, that was a significant factor um, that the student would be less prone to violence in the school. And we know, again, we'll go back to the data, we know half of school shooters, half of school shooters profiled out as either being, having virtually no friends or being loners. So when we did our youth risk behavior survey in DeForest last year, we asked this question to our middle school and high school. Do you agree or disagree that you feel that you belong in school? In our middle school, 85% of students agreed that um, they, they, they agree that they feel that they belong in school. So we have 1,000 kids, 150 kids couldn't answer that where they said agreed. So we had 150 kids who you know, did not apparently feel that they could state that they belonged at school. We got to our high school, um, 65%. So again, 1,000 kids in our high school, 350 kids were unable to answer that question. Um, our data looks very similar to data of the hundreds of schools that participated across this in Wisconsin. So we're not profiling out different than other buildings in, in other schools. But we look at that data, Joe, and we know that 50% of, of uh, school shooters um, didn't have close friends or loners or, or, or didn't have that connection to school. Uh, that tells me right there that the emphasis needs to be on connecting kids to school and connecting kids to kids. So that's one part that um, I feel that the data strongly uh, conveys that message to us. Um, another part that came out, very powerful statistics, 98% of the attackers had difficulty coping with losses um, or personal failures. So something had happened in their life, um, possibly a relative past, uh, possibly a, that they... Um, had some personal, um, you know, failure maybe with, you know, whatever it would be. I think with one student, it was with an athletic team or something like that. They didn't, didn't make the, the cutter. Um, but that the students just could not cope with that, with that failure. 
Um, there are also instances where students were so driven to get, um, you know, like an ACT score or perfect scores and all of this that um, not achieving that was also something that was described. Um, 93% of attacks uh, or attackers had planned out the attack ahead of time. And Joe, most cases, well in advance. And of that, so you have people, these students planning these out ahead. But 70, um, another statistic that's very powerful, 71% of the attackers felt either persecuted, bullied, threatened, or attacked by others at school. So again, let's just look at that. 71% of um, students of the 37th involved in um, shooting situations in schools, 71% um, had been uh, persecuted, bullied, threatened, attacked. So is it important to have a, a way, you know, the question is important to have a way that students uh, understand what bullying is, what harassment is, and how to report that? Absolutely. Uh, that's huge. I mean, that is an extremely strong correlation to have that data out there. So um, I know there's, there's always a knee-jerk reaction when people say, well, um, school shooters, you know, maybe they were bullied. Well, they might have, they might not have, have been bullied at some point. Statistically, though, in, in the study of, of that core from 1974 to 2000, you know, 71% did fall into that profile category. category. Um, now, research hasn't really been done, Joe, you know, even though these, this research um, was very thorough, it didn't go back and look at schools and say, did you have a reporting system for bullying, for harassment? What did that look like? You know, what it probably looked like 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, five years ago was, you know, if you have a concern, tell the teacher and bring it up or, or tell the principal or tell the counselor. Was there a system, though? You know, I'm guessing probably not. Um, is, is it important and absolutely vital to have a system? Completely. It, it completely is. Um, here's another piece, Joe. In, the, in those cases, 75% of, um, of those instances, someone else knew ahead of time that uh, this person was planning an attack. And in some cases, it was multiple people, multiple students. So, uh, again, the having a system to report this, and I'll go, you know, directly to our, our Spragio system, for example. Our Spragio system provides a 24-hour anonymous wait for information to come forward into the school setting. Um, to have that is very critical in these situations because, um, again, three-fourths of these situations, someone else knows that this is going to happen. And if they have a means to report that, whether um, it, it be whatever... Uh, means that the school has, but again, Spragio could be that means. Uh, that's extremely important. So, uh, really, really powerful, um, you know, powerful stuff coming out of out of those studies that I that I gleaned. So, as I go back and I talk to other administrators, and as I present now, you know, on more of a statewide level, here's something I want to talk about because in Wisconsin, and it's not uncommon, Joe, all over the country, schools get report cards from the state. So we get report cards for every one of our buildings from the state. And it will it takes in consideration of how, you stu how your students do on reading and math, I mean, which are extremely, obviously, important school setting. Um, but nowhere on that report card, nowhere is it reflective of how do you do for school connectedness, which involves, you know, how are you connecting kids? How are you working also probably with reporting of harassment, of bullying, and responding to that. You might say that's nebulous. It'd be hard to figure that out. Absolutely not. It'd be easy to figure that out um, because you could do your youth risk behavior survey. You could analyze um, data that's come in through the systems. Do schools have systems and certain criteria for that? Um, Joe, I mean, frankly, it wouldn't even be qualitative research, which there's nothing wrong with qualitative, but it, it would be a chunk of it quantitative. I mean, very hard number-driven research, and you could give schools a a grade or a, a certain ranking on how they are for school connectedness. It would have those factors in it. And we also know, Joe, it's just not violence and behavior. We know school connectedness statistically increases academic performance too. 
so we lose the boat on or the boat sails, um, and, and we're not on it when this happens. And I know I've talked to you before, and, and I've shared where when I talk to school districts, um, sometimes you know bullying reporting and, and things like that really aren't on their radar. It's not right up front on the radar. You know, and I thought about that a little bit more. Why is that happening? And I think it's happening in part because uh, schools aren't held accountable for that by the state. And it really comes down to this academic report card and, and the push on that. And, um, you know, when you have 100 uh, irons in the fire, sometimes those other irons are the ones that, uh, that you have to address. But uh, I can tell you one thing that I'm going to continue to champion and become much more uh, vocal about is the fact that we have a huge hole in the reporting system of how a school um, does collectively to serve students. It's much more than academic. There should be a school connectedness score, a rubric that's defined and put out there for schools, and then a process to say, here are things to do from you know efforts to, to connect kids to school to your reporting system and your investigation system and all of those and how those play in. So it's kind of changed my viewpoint somewhat, but uh, I, I'm, the research, again, points us in a direction that uh, legislatively we've been taken off that, that course. Um, and I think people ask, you know, why, why aren't we stronger in some of these areas? And again, that's just not been a legislative emphasis. Well, David, you have uh, been a wealth of information and uh, certainly appreciate the time that you always are willing to spend with us. Is there anything that as we wrap up today you want to leave folks with? Um, just a few things. Uh, you know, one, Joe, again, is uh, be transparent with your with your community, um, but, um, you know, don't, don't, you don't have to provide. Um, for example, um, one school district asked me and said, uh, would it make sense if we published all of our um, our school, uh, our layouts for all of our schools or our schematics so people knew where all the rooms were and stuff. And I said, absolutely not. Um, that's information that you don't want out there and you don't want your school schedules and things like that. So, so you know, don't be reactionary because that's information that, that um, you know, if someone is, is planning to access a school setting that, that you don't want out there. Um, but Communicate with your principals as, as a leader and principals communicate with your staff of the things that you've done, your entrances, your drills, ask staff for input, um, bring in your law enforcement. Joe, we had our law enforcement here yesterday. We did a lockdown drill. Um, I walked through with them and uh, in, so did our, our billing principal from a neighboring school. Um, and they'll tell you, you know, they're, they're an excellent resource, but access law enforcement update things like flip charts and keep them simple. Um, our, our flip charts are very direct and to the point, step by step of here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do if it's a missing student, if it's a tornado, but then, you know, active shooter, bomb threat too. Uh, it, there can be a tendency to make those uh, very sophisticated. Uh, if somebody calls in right now and there's a bomb threat, um, I'm, my mind is racing. Uh, I need to go to something that is very step-by-step -step, or if there's a situation in a school. So um, keep things simple and um, avoid being, com you know, complicated. Uh, and, you know, finally, Joe, we do, um, yesterday we did, I, I led a 35-person um, crisis activity. We did a simulation yesterday. We do these from time to time in the district, but um, our simulation yesterday was a bus accident. So people came in, my counselors, principals, our bus director. We had three police officers there, and we ran through a full um, tabletop simulation of, you know, what would happen if we had a bus accident. So I had it all laid out. We have information and, and you know, step by step. That's invaluable for a school to do with, with lockdown drills. What do we do if we had not necessarily even an active shooter, but what if we had a suspicious person coming into our, our school? Um, you know, what if we did have a bomb threat? Because there's a lot of redundancy in how you respond to things. Um, but I'm, I'm working on something pretty unique, and I'll share it with you so you can, it can be shared, you know, on a global scale. But I, I also think you can do tabletops of um, what happens if we have a, uh, a bully incident or even like more of a viral 
bully incident that that goes on or that we uh, you know we're uncovering something that seems to be um, repeated in a pattern um, because uh, again Joan I shared previously in an interview we had an, an instance this year where um, a student at our our middle school didn't show up for school and then um, had texted and was reporting out to a friend some things that 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 student had experienced and um, you know there, there was some very high concern for the safety of that student and then we were able to um, you know immediately respond to that once we knew but again I think to walk through those to do those actual drills and to use scenarios of you know what if we had you know whether it be bullying or what if we had you know lockdown uh, tabletop exercises are wonderful uh, they're, they're you know wonderful and meaningful so again, I will share about my resources with you, and I'll, I'm going to share out some other documents that you can make available. Our counseling scope and sequence. I put together talking documents for our staff when parents ask them about um, school safety, and then even parents ask about uh, active shooters. So some of the things that I shared with you today, I think it's it's important to get that information out thank to people. So you. thank you, a wealth of resources. Well, I certainly appreciate you taking time with us. I know this video is going to be of tremendous value for schools, people connected with schools, uh, particularly in light of recent incidents you know, across the nation. But it is certainly a timely topic and one that's going to continue to confront schools and anyone related or connected to schools. So uh, thank you again. David Perodin here, Director of Student Services, DeForest Area School District, Wisconsin. Thank you, Joe.